Hi, my name is Kevin. I'm a project supervisor with AOC Archaeology. Uh, I was a supervising field archaeologist during the excavations that took place at Fort House in November last year. I also had the task of conducting historical research and creating a publication about the work conducted in order to present a more comprehensive story surrounding the fort's inception, construction and use. 18th century Fort North Leith was the final fortification to be built on a town that historically has been dominated by conflicts, sieges and fortifications since the 12th century. However, as the gun battery at Leith Fort never fired a shot in the defence of the town, and due to its long-term use as one of four barracks within Edinburgh, the historical significance of the fort has been somewhat overshadowed by its more popular predecessors from the 16th and 17th centuries. The majority of the fort was demolished in the 1960s during redevelopment for housing. With part of the site currently undergoing another round of redevelopment, a programme of excavations, post-excavation analysis and historical research have allowed Leith Fort to be rediscovered. Excavations, as you can see, are the green areas to the left. Uh, all the black and white are services that are in the areas that we couldn't get into. And the yellow is just a, a two metre buffer around the wall so they don't knock it down. Um, I say the excavations were undertaken by UC Archaeology, helped by a large number of volunteers from the local area, invited to take part by City of Edinburgh Council. A series of features and building foundations were revealed that relate to the various phases of the site's use as part of a bounded field system, a military fortification, and then a residential housing estate. This is one of the later uh, building foundations uh, in the northwest corner, which you'll see again later on. It's my intention to present a summary of the documentary, cartographic, and archaeological evidence related to the site at Leith Fort, with the hope of starting a comprehensive <coughs> record of the military base's history. It's also my intention to provide the identity of the fort's architect, as the documentary research has shown that the design of the fort's buildings has been falsely accredited to James Craig, the famous architect of Edinburgh's new town. The creation of Leith Fort came about due to the actions of a Scotsman named John Paul Jones, who had adopted the cause of the American colonies vying for independence and became one of the first officers to be enlisted in the American Navy. Between the years of 1778 and 1780, Jones was in command of his own fleet. In September 1779, Jones had his sights set on Leith, knowing it was undefended, and set sail with seven other vessels intended to land in the town and exact a ransom of £200,000 that would go towards the reimbursement which Britain owes to the much injured citizens of the United States. However, owing to a severe gale, Jones' attempts to land were thwarted. The delay created by the storm gave the people of Leith a chance to mount some crude defences. The ancient cannons were dragged up to the citadel from the naval yard, and artillerymen with some brass artillery pieces positioned themselves further west. With the town warned of his approach, and the infantrymen at Edinburgh Castle so close, Jones decided to give up his venture and sailed south. In the aftermath of the panic created by Jones, the authorities in Leith decided to create new defences for the town, and the construction of a battery was started later that year on grounds belonging to the Hill House Field Estate. Records indicate that the area had been part of a field system since the 15th century, with evidence of this found during the excavation. A number of former plough soil deposits were revealed that indicate the fort was built on undulating sand dunes that were levelled prior to construction. This is one of the 20th century building foundations and you can see the dark layer. That's the plough soil. It's up to about 75 centimetres of soil under there and it was a bit deeper than some other areas as well. The ground previously sloped to north and southeast, and where the soils have been built up by the preparations for the fort construction, a number of medieval and post-medieval ceramics, as well as 17th century clay pipe stems and bowls, were found in the sealed deposits underneath. Furthermore, a field boundary ditch containing earlier ceramics was revealed along the northwest edge of the site. This feature in the range of artefacts within and around it helps to date the agricultural use of the site from as early as the 12th century. When work on the battery commenced, it originally consisted of a simple rampart with nine guns stationed upon it to cover the harbour. However, a plan for a larger battery or redoubt were accepted by the town provost in 1780, with the design and construction of the redoubt being given to James Craig, the architect of Edinburgh's new town. 
Work began later that year, and by 1781, the battery had been constructed and armed, firing its first rounds to mark the King's birthday on the 4th of June. By 1785, the almost complete redoubt and battery was planned by Captain Fraser. The plan showed the northeast facing battery with a rectangular two story complex of buildings to the southwest. Enclosing this on three sides was a larger walled area with bastions at the southern and western corners, containing a parade ground with proposed barracks and further proposed stores to the southwest. These buildings here hadn't actually been built yet, they were just proposed at that point. Once completed, it was manned by one officer and 18 to 20 artillerymen from the castle until 1793 when the Royal Artillery took over the command. When the Royal Artillery took over, the Napoleonic Wars had just begun, with thousands of British troops being sent to all corners of the world to fight against the revolutionary forces of France. The redoubt of Leith became a part of a much larger barrack and fort network throughout Britain, with artillerymen from the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the Royal Regiment of Artillery and soldiers from several of the infantry regiments being quartered there for anything between a couple of months to several years. It's during this period that the redoubt of Leith is enlarged in order to house French prisoners of war to the immediate southwest of the current redoubt. There are no indications that the structures used for housing the prisoners were permanent in nature, as Ainsley's map from 1804 shows no signs of buildings to the southwest of the redoubt and no evidence of early temporary structures was found by the excavation. First plans for any structures on the site are not seen until November 1804, when a plan for the fort is drafted by Captain Henry Evett. These plans indicate the enlargement of the redoubt into a fort with large stables, guard houses and stores. As well as plans for the creation of the fort to the southwest, Evett had also drafted plans for rearranging the buildings within the redoubt, creating a large officer's block, which is the one highlighted in red, and barracks, where the southwest wall used to be, with kitchens, a wash house, and a hospital all situated on the former parade ground. All in this area here. The fort opened sometime between 1814 and 1821, when modern-day North Fort Street was constructed, and the fort's initial layout differed slightly from Evett's original design. According to Evett's plans, the fort consisted of a large stable block next to and parallel with the western wall. However, the 1822 map shows this stable block with a building situated behind it running the entire length of the western wall. Up in here. Fragmentary remains of the eastern wall of this building were revealed in the excavations along with the base of a drain found outside the building and a culvert running from the drain back through the eastern foundation. The drain in there, and you had the top of the base of the culvert running through here. And then this wall is the outer wall of the building along the edge. And the dark, the dark soil again, that's the plough soil. The first photograph you saw was just in this area here. Two guard houses with adjoining stores have been constructed as planned, with the storeroom to the far southeast having been located in the excavation. The storage building was the only structure in the excavation to have parts of the floor intact, and it could be seen that the internal layout of the building may have been altered throughout its life. As such, the only artefacts found within it were either modern or related to the 19th century constructions, such as iron nails and other metal fittings found commonly in sites of this period. Along the eastern wall, the 1822 map shows that the buildings labelled shops by Everett have been extended into the southern corner. The gunshed, on the other hand, remains the same as it was depicted by Everett, placed along the small section of south facing perimeter wall. One sandstone foundation and two reused sandstone culverts were revealed where the southeast edge of the gun shed would have been. Typically, on a site like this, you'd hope that the culverts would give you most of the artifact. As I said, they've already been reused. When we opened that up there, there was modern brick and concrete at the base. So they'd obviously opened these drains up, cleaned them out, and then fitted them again with, with new mortar and brick. This is a modern concrete foundation for a small street for a small set of houses from the 1950s, as is that there. The gun shed wall is just this wall here. As for the large stable block dominating the eastern edge of the fort, this had been constructed as intended and was revealed in the excavations consisting of two large outer walls 
built of sandstone with deep foundations that penetrated the earlier soil. Throughout the walls here. A smaller inner wall was also revealed that split the stables into two equal sides. It had been truncated by later redevelopments of the fort and the floor surface had been removed, providing little in the way of artifactual material. The final change from Everett's plan is the rectangular building to the north of the northwest gatehouse with a perimeter wall surrounding it. This is labelled as a powder magazine in later maps and was partly revealed during the excavation. The main structure consisted of sunken sandstone foundations measuring 1.3 metres thick, surrounded by a thinner outer wall. It's thought that the thickness of the walls would have helped to contain a gunpowder explosion, with the perimeter wall preventing material blowing out with the magazine area. The enlarged fort was initially used as, a, as an artillery station and had the capacity to contain 350 men and 150 horses. It no longer functioned as a harbour defence, as by the time of its completion the battery had become obsolete. In the latter part of the 18th century and into the 19th century, buildings were being built on land in the firing line of the battery, and with the town wishing to expand beyond the old boundaries, the battery had become more of a ceremonial device rather than a functioning defensive installation. The town's defences have been taken over by a Martello tower that was constructed in 1809 at the mouth of the harbour. Once the fort had been established, the layout of the buildings within it remained the same until around 1852 when changes are made along the northwest edge. The building that was situated against the western boundary wall has been removed, as well as the stable block that was directly in front of it. These have been replaced by a summer house and garden that is situated in the western corner of the, float, of the fort. Part of the wall enclosing the garden was revealed in the excavations and was constructed of reused sandstone blocks, most likely originating from the buildings that had been demolished. Furthermore, a circular garden refuse pit filled with flower pot fragments, glass and animal bone is found in the western corner, providing archaeological evidence of the use of the area as a summer house and garden. The 1852 Ordnance Survey also provides information on the function of the other buildings within the fort complex. As previously stated, the rectangular building with the perimeter wall surrounding it is the powder magazine. The northwestern gatehouse is labelled as the storekeeper's house, with ordnance store number two adjoined to it. The other gatehouse is labelled as guard room with prison cells and ordnance store number one. And the large stable block and gun shed are labelled as Everett had suggested. But the shops along the eastern wall are split into small stable at this end and the northwest end, next to a farrier shop, then Smith's shop, then Wheelwright's shop, before coming to the canteen in the southern corner. Only one small section of wall was revealed in the location of these shops, with the excavations limited by the proximity of the perimeter wall. Into the latter half of the 19th century, the fort continues with some small changes to the layout. The Ordnance Survey of 1877 shows the summer house in the western corner is removed and replaced by two small unmarked buildings. An L-shaped foundation forming the southeast and part of the northeast foundation of the largest of these buildings was revealed in the excavations. And interestingly, where this foundation crossed the former field boundary, large stones have been placed within the ditch fill in order to stabilise the construction of the wall. Another small change to the fort's layout is the enlargement of the powder magazine perimeter wall with another building included within it. Finally, the well appears to have gone out of use in this period, indicating the possibility of piped water being used in the fort for the first time. Into the latter half of the 19th century, a number of calls are made for changes to Leith Fort and other military accommodations in Edinburgh due to the poor condition of the buildings. However, it is not until the early 20th century that construction takes place at the fort. By the time of the Ordnance Survey in 1906, the redevelopment includes the removal of the powder magazine along with a number of other changes. The gun shed, the two gatehouses and stores, and the 1870s building in the northwest corner survived the 20th century re reorganisation, but the stable block and the shops are removed from the southeast edge. As replacements in this area of the fort, two large linear buildings are constructed, revealed in the excavations as containing 
as consisting of wide concrete foundations with sandstone facades. The photograph behind me was taken in the 1950s and it indicates that the buildings were three storeys in height with dressed stone around the windows and doors. The most thoroughly of the new buildings was seen to contain a sunken boiler room with coal store that would provide heat for the adjacent buildings thought to be barrack blocks. Over at the northwest edge, two new buildings have been constructed, both of which were revealed to have similar concrete foundations to the barracks, but may have been a brick construction rather than sandstone, given the amount of brick rubble overlying the area. This is how the fort would have been organised at the outbreak of the Great War playing its part as one of four barracks in the Edinburgh area, along with Edinburgh Castle, Pierce Hill and the new Redford Barracks. After the war, no changes are made to the layout of the buildings until 1946, when one additional building is placed to the immediate northwest of the large barrack blocks. In the previous photograph, you can see that building that was just in here actually looked more to be like sheds rather than a permanent structure. One significant change to the use of the fort is made as the fort's designation is changed from Leith Fort Royal Artillery Depot to Leith Fort Barracks, indicating that the fort had changed from being a Royal Artillery Station to an Army Barracks. It remained in use throughout the Second World War as an Army base before its closure at the final parade of the Royal Army Pay Corps in April 1956. But unfortunately, as the fort was not engaged in any conflicts, was never fired upon, and appears to have been meticulously looked after and cleaned up by the regiment stationed there, the excavations did not find many military artifacts. Only two pieces of lead shot, the other one looking the same as this, and a possible military button with so much corrosion you couldn't see the face, uh, were found during the excavations that may represent the military use of the site. These finds came from the earlier soil horizons in the northern corner, and most likely represent lost objects that were part of practice fire in the case of the light show. One of the interesting facts attached to the history of Leith Fort is that the architect who designed the buildings within it is said to be James Craig. Craig was a famous architect in the 18th century, winning the contest to design Edinburgh's new town when he was 27 years old. As stated earlier, James Craig was commissioned in 1780 to build the redoubt and battery, at least according to the plans of Captain Fraser. As the layout would be designed for a military purpose, James Craig would have had little input into that aspect of the redoubt's design. However, he is attributed with the design of the redoubt's elevations and possibly the internal floor plan, responsible for the design of the large enclosing officers block to the back of the battery, as well as the proposed barracks and stores along the southwest wall. Once the redoubt was built, there are records showing that being paid by the military was to prove difficult, so it took until 1792 for Craig to be remunerated for the designs and construction he undertook. A few years later, in 1795, Craig passed away at the age of 56. Almost a decade after Craig's death, the Royal Engineer Captain Henry Evatt produced drafts for the enlargement of the redoubt into a fort as well as drafting plans to reorganise the redoubt to include a hospital and a new barrack block. Interestingly, despite these plans being created after James Craig's death, he is still attributed as the architect and designer of these new buildings, with architectural historians stating that Craig designed the guardhouses and high defensive walls of the fort. Despite ever having sent the elevations of the guardhouses, the new barrack block and the hospital along with his plans of the fort layout, these claims of Craig's involvement have now become a part of the history and folklore of the fort, taking credit away from the actual architect of the still upstanding guardhouses and perimeter wall, Captain Henry Evatt. Being associated with a famous architect is desirable for the stature of a local area and its heritage assets, but so should being associated with an architect that was also an acclaimed military leader. Henry Evatt started his military career with the Royal Engineers in 1793 becoming a lieutenant by 1798 and was a captain at the time of drafting his plans for the fort around 1804. He then went on to command the 9th Gibraltar Company of Royal Artillery from 1806 and played a crucial part in the wars with Spain during this time. He finished his career as a lieutenant general with the Royal Engineers in 1838 and lived until 1851, having been a successful military leader. Hopefully he can now also be remembered as the designer of the Leithport gatehouses that have so often been thought to be the work of such a famous architect as James Craig. 
Historical research and archaeological excavations related to Leith's last fortification have allowed for a more detailed story of the site to be revealed. Despite the fort's creation after a panic-stricken episode involving a threat to Leith from the American Navy and a £200,000 ransom, the fort's history beyond this point is relatively uneventful. The battery and cannons that were hastily erected became obsolete within a couple of decades, and the fort became an artillery depot and barracks for the remainder of its life. It played its part during 175 years of conflict from the Napoleonic Wars in the late 18th century through to the Second World War in the 20th century, before being closed and the site reused for housing an expanding population. Fortunately, the 1960s redevelopments retained Captain Henry of its guardhouses, and the fort's earlier footprint was able to be revealed under the modern foundations and landscape. It is hoped that the archive created by the excavations and post-excavation analysis will continually allow Leith Fort to be rediscovered.